I'm the next speaker. There comes a time when treaties, international agreements, regulations and laws don't work enough. And that is when case law steps in, when there is legal case before a court, before a jury. That is where the gaps in laws or in legislation are filled. That is where the fine points are refined. And sometimes, hopefully, what is good for the cultural remains and for the archaeology actually happens in court. In my career, I've had the opportunity to participate in four shipwreck cases. One, early on, involved the plundering of artifacts from a marine protected area in the United States, both a national park as well as a national marine sanctuary, where an organized dive club came in, knowledgeable of the regulations, and recovered artifacts from a number of shipwrecks. Fortunately, their activities had been advertised there were two undercover officers on board the vessel. But what then ensued were two very lengthy court cases for those who did not plead guilty immediately, in which both civil and criminal sanctions were brought. It was a fascinating case, but we're not going to dwell on that. The other case in which I was involved was a commercial recovery in which, in this case, a steamship known as the Central America, which sank with a large cargo of gold, was commercially recovered and others intervened in court to take a stake in that recovery. In this case, the legal principle that ultimately was decided was not one that affected, at least in a positive way, cultural property, but rather was the question of property itself and the question of ownership. In this case, these were the insurance companies who had insured the cargo of gold and who then advanced their claim in the court seeking an award back of their property. They ultimately prevailed with an award of 10 percent of their property. The good news, I guess, is coming back to what I said earlier, at least in this case, the principle of finders keepers and somebody going and taking everything was modified to accept the presence of ongoing private rights. This is a double-edged sword, obviously, because if you have a private owner who still wishes to commercially exploit or recover, then that is not necessarily an argument for underwater cultural heritage protection. But it is a step towards defining a body of law in the oceans and in the water, and particularly where previously people have considered this a frontier in which very little law applies. It also underscores the fact that the primary law, which has ultimately been that which we have had to deal with, has not been legislation affecting cultural heritage per se, but has actually been the ancient practice of admiralty law. Two other cases more recently very heavily to me underscored the role that archaeology must play in cases, very particularly admiralty cases. The first case, very briefly, was one that saw the first appearance of underwater cultural heritage before the International Tribunal of Law at the Sea, most recently in October of 2012 at that court in Hamburg, where the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines disputed the seizure of vessels by the Guardia Civil of Spain, which had been ostensibly embarking upon oil and gas exploration in the Bay of Cadiz, but instead were found to possess a certain number of artifacts, as well as scuba tanks with which the bottom had been removed cut, that is, and then covered over by the boots or the rubber enclosures on the bottom of the tanks to sit on a deck, making them perhaps conveniently an effective place to place artifacts. In this case, the basic argument of Spain was that this was an internal matter and that these people had acted against the laws of Spain and that their seizure of this vessel, these vessels was legitimate and that they were prosecuting the law correctly. The case that went before the International Tribunal was to argue that and to ask for the return of the vessels. But in this case, of course, the question of whether or not they were innocently engaged in oil and gas exploration came up. I had the privilege of being, in a private capacity, the pro bono archaeologist and witness before the Tribunal, speaking to some key questions, such as whether 
one used propeller wash to search for oil and gas, which one does not, incidentally, and particularly noting that the areas in which they had operated closely matched, in fact, came directly over sites identified by previous archaeological surveys as being collections of large groups of Spanish shipwrecks, in particular flotas, or ships that had been engaged in convoy duties, many of them said to carry treasure, as well as the site of some well-known battles. I'm happy to say that Spain prevailed in the case. The final case, and the one that I specifically want to speak to today, is the previously mentioned Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes, which, when lost in 1804, saw the sinking of a Spanish naval fregata, Mercedes, in combat with the British Royal Navy. The loss of that ship was not only a cataclysmic loss of life, as well as His Majesty's ship, but also the loss of a certain amount of treasure, which was being transported by Mercedes and other vessels from Lima, Peru, to Spain at a time when the wars of Europe were engulfing many of the parties, and Spain in particular, separated now from that conflict, was obligated to pay a certain amount of money to Napoleon Bonaparte in order to remain neutral in the conflict. Britain, desirous of intercepting that money, going to their foe, stopped the Spanish ships, demanded that they surrender. The Spanish demurred, shots were fired. A lucky shot for the British, perhaps, perhaps unlucky for everyone, penetrated into the hull of Mercedes, which exploded violently and dramatically, killing not only the naval personnel on board, but also the families of some of the officers who were transporting their loved ones back home to Spain. Mercedes was identified as one of a group of shipwrecks that Odyssey Marine Exploration wished to salvage with permission and with a cut going to Spain. Spain demurred, said no thank you. What then transpired ultimately in court is that Odyssey Marine took their vessel without activating their transponders, went out to a site, made a recovery, took that back to Gibraltar, loaded it on an aircraft, flew it to the United States, and filed an admiralty arrest. The, six, the, the case that then ensued took a great deal of time, and without going through all the legal points, I think the key thing to remember is that ultimately Spain did prevail, and the artifacts recovered from Mercedes, in particular, more than half a million pieces of silver as well as gold and a, and a small amount of artifacts did return to Spain, as you'll hear later. The key thing in this entire case, however, was having to prove that one, there was a shipwreck, two, that it was a shipwreck of a certain vintage, three, that it was a specific shipwreck, four, that it was a shipwreck which remained the property of Spain, and five, that this recovery had transpired in violation of Spain's wishes. As the archaeologist working on the case, I think the one thing that was very clear, and I did this again in a pro bono capacity, was that archaeology plays a very critical role in cases such as this in a variety of ways. In the past, usually, I've been asked to come and speak to damage which has occurred. In this case, I had to play the role of being the investigator, acting as an archaeologist, looking at evidence, but without necessarily all the evidence that would have been before me as a practicing archaeologist. Imagine you're a detective coming into the room that has been the scene of a crime. You are not allowed to see the photographs of much of the evidence. You're not allowed to examine very carefully a map which shows the exact placement of every bullet casing fired and the spatters of blood. Imagine that you are also told that much of the information you seek is proprietary and that at every step of the way as you examine the evidence, it has to be wrested from the other side through an action by the judge. I'm not overstating the case. If you go back and read the final judgment, what you will see is that Odyssey Marine Exploration was chastised by the court and fined $1 million US, essentially for bad faith dealings with the court and with the Kingdom of Spain. We ultimately found, despite the allegations of Odyssey Marine, not only in press, but actually directly to my face, that somebody had merely come along and dumped large amounts of silver into the sea, perhaps in distress. I find that to be as persuasive an argument as our ship is going down, so let's all throw these overboard. 
At the same time, we were told there was no evidence of a shipwreck. Ultimately, what we were presented with was a photo mosaic of the site without scale, without orientation, and with careful examination with a magnifying glass, we were then resorting to figuring out relative positions of artifacts, relative scale. In this, we noted a number of features, features which turned out to be not only canon, but ceramics, very diagnostic ceramics, as well as large masses which proved to be sections of the ship's hull, the wood consumed by marine organisms, but very carefully articulated fragments still delineated by the metal fasteners which had once held the timbers together, some in close association with guns, which clearly demonstrated ultimately when we mapped it out that a vessel had violently exploded and fallen to the seabed, portions of which were the bottom of the hull in which you could still see the frames or the ribs with gravel ballast in between them, as well as other areas which were clearly sections of gun decks and the sides of hulls where guns had pierced through, in one case a cannon actually sticking through the metal fasteners indicating that deck, carriage, and section of hull had traveled to the seabed bed together. The most vexing part of the case was trying to match that map then to footage which was provided, but imagine rather than seeing a complete film, you have to figure out the plot, the principal characters, and ultimately how the film ends because you see snippets which appear in different sections here and there. So in that case, the dialogue between one character and another cuts off mid-sentence, and then you see dialogue from a later portion of that film cut in next. Again, no exaggeration, because these were very carefully cut, particularly every time you approached the diagnostic artifact, such as a gun, and then the cameras quickly moved away or simply went black before you could see something like the crest on a gun or numbers. We were ultimately able to prove the point however, that this was Mercedes and that it was ultimately a Spanish vessel. Ironically, at the very end of the case, a last group of artifacts was recovered, having been discovered in a warehouse in Gibraltar. The American lawyer for the firm that responsible for the case went to Gibraltar to recover these. And interestingly to note, among the artifacts recovered were coins which clearly showed blast damage, which somehow had not come before the courts in the United States and a concreted mass which upon cleaning in the National Museum of Archaeology in Spain proved to be the buttons and the breastplate of a Spanish Marine officer in service to the Royal Navy. So archaeology can play a critical role and a powerful role, but it's important to remember that archaeology can only do so much as legislation can do so much. One of the great arenas that we must ultimately find ourselves engaging more in, very particularly, is in the courtroom using every available tool, but I would also argue archaeology as well, to continue to make the case. Ultimately, all battles are fought in the trenches, not necessarily out in the open field.